Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And XRP is one of the serious top performers in the last 24 hours, outperforming the top 30 projects by market cap. Uh, Omise Go is also pushing a really nice double digit gain, 13.8%. Celsius, oh my gosh, they are super strong. And even Zcash is doing admirably well. So in this video, I'd like to set one thing straight. I'd like to level up your overall knowledge, and I'd like to share with you a confirmed new corridor for RippleNet. First, the clarification. As I'm hearing some really strange, wild speculation about the XRP Community Fund. This entity recently received 6.5 million in donations from Ripple Coil and GitHub. But the XRP Community Fund Foundation has its roots back to 2019. You can see that they are not an entity that's separating from the mothership. It sounds so strange to me. This was launched and formed officially registered in the Netherlands back in September 2019. You can read about it in this very very well written article by Hodor. Hodor is somebody who was giving us a lot of updates. Uh, he is now working on a project, so he is focusing on something else uh, for the time being. I don't know anything, but I just get this feeling we're going to hear from him soon. The foundation was started as a, a from a generous donation from Wheatsy Wind. You can see Wheatsy's right here and along with some other community members. I think um, when you look at the original seats that were held on the foundation, it is just now maturing into something that is going to be very, very beneficial. And Bitcoin even had a foundation that was based in Washington, D.C., it was a central nonprofit foundation meant to create a healthy ecosystem. It has since been dissolved, but Ethereum has one that is located in Zug, Switzerland, and it's still supporting the ecosystem. It's not a company. It's there to provide financial and non-financial support to accelerate growth. And you may have heard of DevCon conferences where developers, researchers, thinkers, and makers all gather. Oh, I'd love to see that same for XRP. You can still capture some of those older tweets on the Wayback Machine. And you can see that, please, no conspiracy theories here or making this into something it isn't. It is going to be very, very instrumental in doing some amazing good work. Here's an example of some of the first, first projects that they are involved with. And they are involved with Ripple. You can see that Ripple and the foundation, along with EW0, is <laughs> really going to create the world's first decarbonized blockchain. This was announced on September 30th. It's addressing the environmental challenge for blockchain technologies. With the XRP ledger as the starting point, 100 major energy companies are coming together to make green blockchains the new de facto standard for distributed ledger technology. De facto meaning a practice that exists in reality. So today's tweet from Galgatron. Yeah, I think you've heard that saying that Galgatron knows. Well, I think Galgatron knows. This is a tweet, Bitcoin destroys the earth. I think this is just a peek into what is going to be a serious, and I mean serious, push by global nations on a scale you've never seen before to achieve green blockchains. So now to my level up knowledge. This is transfer wise. There was some talk about when Zagone announced he went to transfer wise that transfer wise was gonna come on to RippleNet. I don't think so. 
If you've ever wondered why this company doesn't come on to RippleNet, it's because they approach cross-border transfers much, much differently than Ripple and the use of XRP. TransferWise holds bank accounts in every single country where it operates. And the money then is converted into a different currency. It moves the money through their proprietary technology. They move it from a balance from a foreign bank account to the correspondent local bank account of the recipient through this matching technology. I think you can think of it as a form of crowdsourcing the other users within their ecosystem. All right, I hope that helps explain that company. And now for the newly confirmed corridor. Well, we knew it was coming. And how did we know? Well, it was back in the, uh, November of last year when swell occurred in Singapore from the senior vice president of global operations, Eric Van Miltenberg. And he talked about Thailand coming in 2020. The exact quote was taken from an ODL expansion conversation at swell. And you can see here that he says, we launched Mexico last year. We launched Philippines after that. Yesterday on stage, we announced Australia was coming online and it did so with Flash FX and BTC markets. And there's a list of countries that are on the roadmap, Thailand being one for 2020. So we knew, but we just didn't know how exactly it was going to shape up. And I always had a feeling that it was gonna come from BitCub. They are a crypto exchange in Thailand with 95% market share. Can you imagine having 95% market share of crypto in one country? <laughs> it's unbelievable. So here is a photo that was posted by BitCub on Twitter. And you can see here the shaking of hands. That looks like a partnership photo. And also too, it was just a couple of months later in January that the media company EnergyBit reported that BitCub was going to join RippleNet. So we knew, yeah, we just didn't know where they were going. Well, today it appears the announcement was made with the founder's Twitter where he put a link to a YouTube video that just came out in the last 24 hours. So BitCub made a public announcement that uh, one of the most exciting projects is RippleNet blockchain. This project allows Thai people to transfer, remit money from Thailand to the UK within 30 seconds. Fees are 0.05%. Yeah, that really is, I think, key. I'm going to play the actual uh, portion of this for you. It, the background noise is really horrible. So uh, just you're going to have to just try to listen well. It's not the best quality of audio. My name is Tom. Uh, I'm the founder of BitCup. We're the largest blockchain cryptocurrency company in the country. BitCup is one of the uh, very first companies that got the spatial license from the Ministry of Finance to allow Thai people to come and buy, to buy and sell digital currency legally. Right now, BitCup controls around 95% market share, meaning that most people, when they think about Bitcoin, they use BitCup for their trading. One of our most uh, exciting projects is called the RippleNet uh, blockchain. This project allows Thai people to transfer, to remit money from Thailand to the UK within 30 seconds. And the phase is down to 0.05%. Meaning that in the future we can transmit between England and Thailand in a frictionless uh, manner. Wow. Yeah. So, yep. I, I think this is um, yeah, I'm really excited for this. I'm so excited that I have yeah, been waiting. <laughs> For this announcement, along with, of course, I'm waiting for the announcement about Japan. I'm getting very close to popping my Perrier Jouet bottle of pink sparkle. 
This is a maker who was the first to introduce pink champagne back in 1764. I love to pop these bottles on very special occasions. All right, I'm going to show you J. Kim. He is to date the person who went to swell last year that was best prepared. And he put together the most professional podcast with David Schwartz, Marcus Treacher, Eric Van Miltenberg, and Brad Garlinghouse. If you've not heard this in its entirety, it really is worth the time. I want you to have a quick listen to the portion with Mr. Van Miltenberg. And I think um, it's, it's interesting and it's still applicable because of the Thai corridor that we just learned about. Again, Asia has been a consistent theme. Uh, we've leaned, leaned into that across Asia Pac, both in uh, you know Mumbai, as I mentioned here in Tokyo with our joint venture partner. So, and we don't see that slowing down. Uh, I think we continue to get a really, really warm reception. What we're doing is resonating. So we will continue to lean into that, and I see our investment really growing in this region. You find that the the customers that you're targeting, they're receptive more receptive, more or less receptive in Asia to sort of this use of digital assets to solve this cross-border payment problem? Um, you know, it varies. It, it certainly, you look at, at um, certain jurisdictions, certain geographies where uh, central banks have have been, you know, at the forefront of providing that regulatory clarity. So mm -hmm. we, we work with um, not only banks and payment providers as our customers, but you know, within the ecosystem, we also have to engage with regulators. The, uh, the, we want to make sure that that they feel comfortable with what we're doing and so they really are clear about what we're not doing. And that clarity oftentimes um, is the leading indicator of where adoption is greatest. Right. And it's not unique to Asia. I think MAS has been super progressive. The Monetary Authority of Singapore has always set the tone for the region and mm -hmm. many other countries, central banks take their lead from some of the really innovative pro progressive thinking um, that's happening here. Because you know, I think the role regulators play is not only important, it's challenging and that they have to regulate and protect the greater populace, but they, they can't do that if they're simultaneously stifling innovation, yes. right? So you've got to find that balance. And I think what is true in this part of the world is that the more forward-thinking regulators have noticed that some of the um, the legacy uh, providers, banks, et cetera, et cetera, that, that they're shortchanging the population. Right. That, 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 that the quality of solution isn't meeting the need. So therefore, they have to adjust the regulation to let some of the fintechs come in and some of these new solutions, still regulated, still compliant, still keeping the greater population safe, but yet uh, allowing innovation and allowing um, these higher quality of services, especially for the needs of the region to be delivered uh, efficiently and uh, and quickly. Yeah, I just, I, 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 uh, I just really want to thank uh, Jay for putting this together because this is um, such a wonderful uh, professional output with a transcript of everything and the timestamps. It's just really uh, worth a listen if you've missed it. All right, I am moving. Yeah, I'm moving to the fluff. So, oh, I have jumping kitties on my lap. So, um, Momo, since I came back, I was actually away um, for a couple of days, I went to this part of Japan called Yaizu, and Yaizu is in Shizuoka Prefecture, and it's uh, really, really beautiful. It's one of the biggest fishing, uh, commercial commercial fishing port, ports in Japan. I think it, um, depending on what kind of fish, it ranks uh, number one to no less than number four in terms of its outputs. And What's really, really interesting is that the um, the manhole covers, which I know is kind of crazy, and I've talked about it before, but this is the one that is found in Yaizu. Japan's manhole covers are really an urban form of art, culture, and industrial design, and it brings people, gosh, 
from around the world, actually, just to come to Japan to view these. They are something that was started in the 1980s, and there's over just 500,000 of them in Tokyo alone. The 1,780 municipalities throughout J Japan actually are creating this art of the manhole. And I'll show you if I come back to here. It's a, it, they cast it first in concrete for the design, and then they make that final cast in metal. And many of them are painted then in a really colorful and um, beautiful way to, you know, take something that nobody pays attention to, but they turn it into a real piece of art and an icon for the cities. And I even found somebody is selling the manhole cover t-shirts on Zazzle. Can you imagine? I just can't believe it. But the most interesting part of Yaizu for me is that it's part of the beginning of the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest depths of the oceans found on our planet. It has a depth of 8,178 meters, and they have uh, discovered creatures that live in these depths some of them have never been seen before as recent as 2017. This is one that is really uh, surprised everybody. It's called the vampire squid. And then this is the Yeti crab. <laughs> I hope Chip sees this video. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure as to what depth this is, but this trench starts in Yaizu and goes all the way towards Guam and the fish that lives at the deepest part is called a snailfish and it's quite beautiful actually. Uh, it was one of those discovered in 2017 and you can see it swimming here. I think it's really quite beautiful. Anyway, it was a fascinating trip. I really feel refreshed. I recommend Yaizu. And I stayed at the uh, Grand Hotel in Yaizu. And that is a two thumbs up place. So if you do head that to that part of Japan, that is the picture that I showed you that has this deck that overlooks the water with Mount Fuji on your left hand side. All right, everybody. Yes, do take care and sayonara for now. Bye-bye.